Welcome everyone. My guest today is managing editor James Kleiman to talk about mortgage and real estate professionals and whether the current standards for both are too low. We may have just gotten back from Gathering of Eagles, but we're not done with events for 2023 yet. This October, we're headed right back to Austin, Texas for Housing Wire Annual, and we want to see you there. We've got a power-packed agenda with content such as our Women of Influence speakers, peak performer playbooks, CEO playbooks, and more to propel your company forward, as well as a bunch of networking events. Because this event is open to real estate executives, mortgage title, and everyone in between, you really have the opportunity to network with people from all across the housing ecosystem. If you want to learn more about the event, or if you're already ready to get registered, head over to housingwire.com on the events tab and you can learn all about it. Not to mention, if you're an HW Plus member, you're going to get 50% off your ticket. So get registered for HW Plus and get registered for the event so we can see you out in Austin. James, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, good to be back, sir. Great to have you on. And I wanted to talk about a story you wrote this week that has generated a lot of interest and a little bit of controversy. And it's that, are there too many real estate agents and LOs? And, you know, so tell me first about why you came up with this and and what the premise is. So I, I've been working with one of our reporters, Bill Conroy, on a feature uh, that, that really kind of dives into this idea that there's a lot of M&A deals in mortgage specifically that are expected to take place. And I think it's been a little bit longer than people thought. I, I would have assumed around this time last year that we would be writing about M&A deals every week. And and in fact, that's not really been the case. There are a lot of deals that are very under the radar that they're not publicizing. Um, but really, that, that kind of brought me to the other idea here, which is we have a major imbalance in the number of real estate agents and loan officers versus the productivity in creating an efficient marketplace, one that works best for the companies that quasi employ these individuals. You know, in a lot of cases for real estate, in most cases, they're 1099s, right? They're not W-2 employees, but they are de facto employees of sorts. Um, and, and then, of course, on the loan officer side, you have a lot of LOs who are licensed, who do a couple deals a year. Some don't do any deals a year and they represent costs and mortgage lenders. Productivity is down about 75% from the spring of 2021. And we really wanted to dive into how do we create a stronger mortgage market, not just for the consumers, but creating sustainable companies by a couple of different definitions, uh, the mortgage industry is expected to shed probably a couple hundred uh, lenders in the next year. And I wanted to take a more data focused look at how many of these LOs are top producers, how many are strong producers, but maybe not the top of the field, how many are middle of the road, and then how many are new or maybe do a deal or two a year and who's licensed and doesn't do any deals whatsoever. And so that was really the kind of the premise here. And, and, and I think, you know, in, in reporting all this, what stuck out to me is that you need both sides of the business, you know, real estate and mortgage to be equally productive. In, in most cases, uh, you know, a borrower is going to get financing and you really want to have a loan officer who is productive, who's knowledgeable, who has a high level of skill, who's able to offer a variety of different products, who's able to troubleshoot and solve problems on the fly with a real estate agent who shares a lot of the same characteristics. And there are quite a few studies out there that show that there are a ton of real estate agents and LOs who don't fit that. And they're taking a fair amount of commission money that I think probably in a healthier marketplace with stronger, um, I, I guess you could say workforce dynamics, wouldn't occur. And that money would go to the professionals who do a lot more business, who are, uh, I think, just better better equipped to handle uh, a volatile marketplace like the one that we're currently in. You know, you use a fictional Aunt Betty in, in this 
story that I think we can all relate to. And it's that that relative we have or the friend we have that is not a full-time agent. They they dip in and out. And and that's one of the beauties of real estate is that you can, it's much more flexible for, for what else is going on in people's lives. Sometimes people are investors, sometimes they, you know, they there's a variety of reasons why someone might have their license. But sometimes we have these people in our families or friends and they do like one or two deals a year. And so, you know, to your point, it's like that they, they why do people choose that, right? Like, why would someone go with someone who does one deal a year when we are in this kind of market that like is for sharks mostly? Yeah, I think really the, the main part of that is you probably trust your Aunt Betty, even if she's not a very good real estate agent, even if she doesn't have a lot of experience, even if she's not, you know, at the vanguard of, of market trends and, you know, being able to to really get to the bottom of comps and, and really get you the best deal so that you're not leaving money on the table you at least feel like your Aunt Betty's not going to screw you over, right? I, I think that's kind of the the prevailing notion here. And I feel like most people have an Aunt Betty, you know, a, a relative or a family friend or someone they know from a social group like a, you know, a church or PTA or something like that. And they're not a professional real estate agent. Maybe they're a homemaker or maybe they, you know, used to be an accountant or, a, you know, a marketing uh, professional and they're, they're semi-retired or you know, this is supplemental income for them. They maybe, maybe are gross 8000 a year, 7000 maybe less uh, doing this kind of work. And so the argument is that Aunt Betty has your back. And even if she's not the best negotiator, even if she's not, um, you know, as up to speed as agents who do this job every day, and it is a career, not a kind of a semi-lucrative hobby, um, that she at least is going to look out and isn't going to pull the rug out from underneath you or pressure you into accepting an offer that maybe isn't, uh, you know, what's best for you and your family. And so that's the argument for Aunt Betty. The, the argument against is, is really, I think, pretty obvious, which is they're not a professional, right? If I'm a reporter, I'm an editor, I wouldn't trust someone who has never done this job professionally to handle one of the biggest stories of the year for my newsroom, um, because I don't know that they have the skill set needed to execute on the assignment correctly. I don't know that they're going to get the best details. I don't know that they're going to have the judgment that I need to ensure that I make the most out of what is, for most people, one of only a couple transactions, you know, life-changing money in, in a lot of cases, right? So, so that's the first part of it. And that's really the consumer-centric argument. The other is the industry-centric argument, which is there are a lot of Aunt Bettys out there, and maybe individually they don't represent a lot in that market. You know, if she's doing one year, one deal a year, maybe one deal every couple of years, right? It doesn't really make much of a ripple, but there are a lot of Aunt Bettys. And in the aggregate, in certain markets, I would imagine most markets, they probably represent about a quarter to 30% of the overall commissions in those markets. And they're also not just within specific you know, price ranges on, on sales. They're not only doing like the deals under 200,000, they're represented pretty much uniformly uh, within all the price tranches. And so there are a lot of Aunt Bettys who are working, you know, the seven, $800,000 deals in not even necessarily high cost of living areas anymore, but, but in, in some of the upper echelon uh, you know, kind of price ranges in various markets. And what that means is for the professionals who do this every day, and I think by most accounts are probably more skilled, certainly better trained, um, they're missing out on those commissions and they spend a lot of money on marketing. They spend a lot of time, time of course is money, um, trying to get these leads and, and you know, I think in another setting, if you didn't have the Aunt Betty, you'd probably do a little bit of research and you would find who the, the best agent is. In an ideal world, you'd probably interview a couple of them and you'd go with who you felt most comfortable and, and most secure with. Um, but in, in a lot of markets, that's not happening because people just, it's human nature. They feel more comfortable. They feel safer working with a, a relative or someone who's kind of a part-timer. And so that deprives the industry of really qualified professionals, one, getting better, and and two, being able to offer the level of service that I think creates a more efficient market. I do think it's so interesting to think about 
This is the reason that I don't think AI or any tech is ever going to disrupt real estate agents totally, because at the end of the day, human wants to do business with the human, even in this context, like you said, like, I think what was so surprising about the data that you presented in this article to me was that some of those high, high cost listings, you know, I mean, these are people who you would think, you know, it really matters. I mean, it's not just like, oh, I'm selling this, you know, whatever my nice, you know, three bedroom home and, you know, okay, I've got this, this aunt, this is like, you know, these are high stakes things and people still go with the person that does like two a year. I mean, I think that was the most surprising thing to me. Yeah, there are a lot of really interesting, I think, nuggets within some of the data, some of which comes from a recent study that came out from the Consumer Federation of America. Um, and then, of course, we recently saw the, the publication of the NAR 2023 member profile, which is just a, a, a massive uh, data dump of, of just incredible um, data on real estate agents' experience, how much money they're making, whether they're at you know an independent brokerage or uh, another kind of model, how many deals they're doing, what kind of marketing they use, all, all sorts of really great granular data. One of the things that I thought was most interesting is really this this sort of joining of the agent and the LO. Because if you think about it, okay, so when you break down the productivity levels of real estate agents, the top 1.5% of real estate agents last year accounted for about 68% of sales, all residential sales in America. And that, that's a crazy number. And if you jump up to 2%, you're at about 75% of the sales. And then to take it even further, you go to the top 10% and you're at more than 90% of all residential sales in America. And then we, we don't have data that is as clean on, on the LO side of things, but this is a referral-based industry, especially now as we enter, not enter, as, as we're firmly in the middle of a purchase-focused market. And so you have a lot of LOs who are desperate to try to get volume, to try to, to try to figure out how to get someone in that home to provide them a mortgage. And they're going to be calling a lot of real estate agents, the bottom 50, 60, 70 percent who basically don't do business, who don't have leads, who don't have deals, who don't have, you know, nephew James calling up and saying, hey, I want to sell my house or hey, I want to buy my house. And just the amount of man hours, the amount of time and expense that is put into just these seemingly rote functions must waste hundreds of millions of dollars every year. And especially now, if you're a lender, you're a real estate agent, uh, agency or brokerage and your margin is so tiny to begin with, and most of your revenue you're already paying out to the LOs and to the agents, and then you discover that probably half of your LOs are sending out, <laughs> you know, a huge amount of communications that will never make it to a viable lead, and you have to think to yourself, can we get more efficient? Like we we have to achieve a better efficiency. At the end of the day, the consumer is the one who is saddled with the crazy mortgage cost, the cost of producing a mortgage is well over $10,000 and it gets higher every single month. And a lot of that is due to regulations and all kinds of other stuff. I'm not suggesting that this is purely because people are chasing non-viable leads and that's that's the whole thing, but it's a big component of it. And, and I just don't think that that's a really good way to approach a, a system that frankly should have higher licensing standards, should have uh, some ability to just remove people. If you haven't done a deal in the last two years, okay, you have to reapply. You have to retake, you know, all kinds of tests where you have to, you have to make some sort of effort to show that you are a professional who takes this seriously because a lot of agents, a lot of LOs complain, and I think rightfully so, that the reputation of LOs and real estate agents at large is not very good. And that's partly because you have a lot of part-timers, amateurs who just have no business in this business. I think one of the things that really struck me, we just had our Gathering of Eagles event about a month ago, and that's uh, for really top top performers in real estate, right? Top brokers and brokerages. And, and then we had vendors there who were showcasing what they could do. And it's the same on the mortgage side. It is unbelievable the difference that some tech can make in this industry as far as like, 
letting you know like who's ready to buy and when, you know, what what products are out there, like the things that are available that I mean, so maybe maybe 15 years ago, there wasn't a big def- differentiation between someone who does this all the time and someone who doesn't. But now I feel like you wouldn't even know about any of those things unless you're really in one of those top brokerages. If you're if you're an LO, I mean, there's so much available to you that would be so helpful for the consumer and for you as the person doing the loan or 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 selling the house. And but you're never going to know that if you're just a, even if you just did it part time, not just once a year, but like just part time. I don't think that you would have the resources that other people have that could really be beneficial to the homeowner. Yeah, and look, the, the data kind of bears it out. So uh, for those who are a little bit more up to speed on on kind of mortgage and mortgage data, it's a company called MMI, and, and they produce a lot of data on LOs and, and their levels of productivity. And let me just rattle off a couple couple quick stats here before before anyone's bored to tears. Okay, so so this is the LO tier data. So tier zero, this is no loans. So these are non-active team members. They're not doing any business. They have licenses, but they're working at the local kiosk at the mall. Uh, they're, they're just, for whatever reason, they're not doing anything. There are 252,232 of them. Tier one, this is one of 30 loans annually. So that's going to be a lot of new part-time or struggling loan officers. There are about 214,000 of them. Tier two, we're talking about medium production LOs. They do about 30 to 60 loans annually. So yeah, give or take three, maybe four per month. That's decent. It's it's not incredible, but it's pretty decent, right? Three, four units. We're looking at about 31,000 LOs, give or take. As we move up, we're now in tier three. That's 60 to 100 loans annually. So these are quality loan officers. There are about 12,000 300 of them per MMI. And now we're going to jump up to the absolute top producers. These guys and gals are banging out 100 to 200 loans annually. These are often team leaders. And there are about 6,200 of them in the country. There are only six tiers here. So we're, we're already getting pretty high up there. This is where we really start to see a leveling off. So we're now at tier five. This is two to 300 loans annually. These are you know, the, the super producers, these are going to be on your, uh, all your top ranking lists every year, right? These are your top 100, top 200. There are 970 of them in the country. That's tier five. Now we get up to tier six. These are the greater than 300 loans annually. These are your franchise players, your, you know, like top echelon super producers. There are 343 of them in this country. So that's your chance. That's your Brian Cohen. That's half the guys on that list are named Cohen for whatever reason. But, uh, you know, your Thune wins. There were 343 of them. That That is your Scotsman Guide list, right? That's pretty much it. So if we roll back the math a little bit, we're looking at a give or take in terms of active LOs out there. We know there are about 350,000 of them in the country. It, you know, it, it goes up a little bit, it goes down a little bit per month. It's been down since, uh, you know, the mortgage industry really took a turn uh, and, and volumes dropped tremendously, but we're still way higher than we should be. We do not have enough volume to justify having 343,000 loan officers in America, even assuming that, let's say for argument's sake, a third of them aren't actually in the workforce, they just have licenses, you know, maybe it's for referrals, maybe maybe they have another, um, you know, kind of function within the industry, but they're not primary loan officers, they're not originators, right? Even then, you still have probably, what, about 200,000 of them? And of that percentage, I think you could maybe argue that about 30 to 40,000 of them are quite productive. And, and there are really consequences to having um, this sort of structural setup for the mortgage industry, because despite some of the challenges, the mortgage lenders that are still out there scrapping, fighting every day, they need sales professionals. And a lot of them are picking up the medium production, low production LOs and hoping that through training or through luck or through lead generation or whatever, uh, maybe they have a, a whole network of Aunt Betty's out there and they can make it work. 
you know, in, in the future, there are a lot of, you know, nephew Jameses were looking to buy or sell. Um, that's just not cost effective for the lender. They still have to pay to keep these people on payroll, even if a lot of them are, are mostly on commissions. It represents a cost when you're in such a tiny margin business that just doesn't really work. And so we're seeing a lot of consolidation within the industry that's, I think, probably going to be starting, you know, around this quarter. I think we're going to see a lot more deals happen. Um, but that's a big factor in in why we're in this place currently. You know, it's why we're having this conversation is because the the costs just can't really be scaled when you don't have a lot of volume to fight for. And we've heard that, you know, um, the NBA has put out like, we're still not at the, you know, we've cut so many jobs from this industry and we're not anywhere near close yeah. to being at the right size for it because to your point, volume and, and to your point, like you, you cannot have these kind of like outliers on there. I mean, I mean, you can, but it's not great business. So I wanted to ask you, like, you've had a lot of feedback from this article and you had some people who were like mad at you, right? I mean, you definitely got the angry emails where it was like, <laughs> oh, you're wrong. So I, I'm interested to hear from people who think it's wrong that we think there should be more professional, you know, it should be more of a professional thing for, for both LOs and real estate agents. What was their argument? Yeah, I, I got quite quite a bit of feedback, um, most of which was pretty positive. And, and I think that kind of tracks because, you know, we write for the the industry professional. We don't write for the part-timer. We are, we are a trade publication that really focuses on the people who do this kind of work day in and day out. And so obviously I, I have a bias toward that. Uh, and, and there are a lot of very, very sharp, very reasonable arguments to be made that keeping part-timers in the business is not actually, you know, uh, as big a detriment as maybe I make it out. Right. Um, and, and by the way, for just so everyone is clear, I don't have an actual Aunt Betty that is a fictional character. Do not do not be calling around asking uh, where she is and, and what she's doing. Uh, but but getting back to your question, Sarah. So yeah, the, the, there's one one uh one answer from a broker uh, out in it's like Arkansas. I'm not quite sure. Um, it says hi, James. I have to strongly disagree with your long essay and statistics. In our sort of free market economy, this is all handled by supply and demand. It's Econ 101. If there are too many of anything, those that can't compete successfully will leave the industry. And that's a very different conversation than whether or not the problem is caused by low barrier to entry. I agree that it's too easy to get a license, but you can blame NAR for that and all the lawmakers. They grease with money to keep standards low. But again, supply and demand will fix the problem by getting rid of the incompetent ones. If I use your logic, I would conclude there are too many people in California who want housing. So the problem is not sufficient housing, just too many people. In a basic urban economics course, this would also be solved by people moving to states that are less expensive and more in line with their wages. This is how it should be. In California, we've been pummeled by our elected politicians that there is a terrible drought here and we have to cut back on water usage. Fair enough, but if that's truly the case, then some lawmakers shouldn't be clamoring for building 3.5 million more housing units, right? Let the system work. Uh, so yeah, a lot, lot to unpack there. Um, you know, I, I I don't quite see eye to eye with the commenter here. Um, you know, I, I think this is not a recent problem. There have been too many agents, too many part-timers in real estate for decades. Uh, and in a more healthy market where there is a lot of inventory and I, I think where, uh, you know, there, there's just greater number of transactions, the issues aren't as pronounced. Um, but when you do have a really particularly challenging market like the one that we're currently in, uh, I think the dynamic is very different. And if you have the part-timers, um, you know, taking anywhere between a quarter and a third of gross commissions in various markets, I don't think that's healthy from a market, purely a market standpoint. And even though, yes, there are some agents and LOs for that matter who have washed out since the market really turned. And, you know, especially since we, we saw a lot of people rushed into real estate in the pandemic in 2020 and 2021, a lot of them, they're, they're just not doing any transaction volume right now whatsoever, but there are a lot more of them that haven't left yet. And the fact that they can still do a deal or two a year, I think means that we're going to have you know, maybe it won't be 25 to 30 percent every year in every market, but they're going to be eating up a sizable percentage of the commissions overall. 
Um, and that's probably going to occur for quite some time. And the way I think about it is look at the incentives here. So who is arguing for all of these part-timers? Who benefits from this? And you have to think, and I think even the commenter acknowledged it, it's these trade groups, right? The NAR in particular is the strength of their organization comes from one, okay, think about the financing, right? Dues. Dues are what, you know, has created um, this this behemoth as a lobbyist, as, as a power, and they do a lot of good work and, and they do, I think, fall on the right side of a lot of issues in housing. And, and this isn't uh, to, to malign the character of NAR by any stretch of the imagination, um, but they are incentivized to keep a lot of members because politically, you know, my Aunt Betty is just as valuable from a political lobbying standpoint as a top producer who's doing four deals a month, not one deal every six months, right? And and so they are keeping standards low because I, or, or they're helping uh, reinforce the system where standards are quite low. Um, the barrier to entry is famously low in real estate and that's by design. That's not an accident. It is a little bit higher in uh Lending, and they're just generally speaking, a lot more restrictions uh, monitoring in in the lending housing finance space than there is in real estate. But talk to an LO at any midsize big shop, and they'll tell you they know five bad LOs for every good one. So I, I think also you probably take that argument anywhere, and you go to an oil well. And, uh, you know, five drillers or riggers or what, I don't even know what they do, actually, will tell you that you know, half the people in that field are idiots and shouldn't be there. So, you know, th- this could just be the human condition, uh, you know, meeting uh, sort of what they call it, what the, the Pareto effect, I think it's called. So that's that's kind of where we are here. Also, you know, I will I will say on the other side, you know, we know a lot of people in real estate who the the low barrier to entry was their step up in the world. Right. Like the it, it is a democratization of like. You can make money and, you know, it's, it's any sales job, but like you can make money and get into, you know, have the American dream for yourself, expand the American dream for other people. And, you know, your background, your college, your whatever doesn't determine that. Now, once you get in, I, I think that it's the, you know, what do you do with it? And those top performers didn't become top performers by doing, you know, doing it on the side or not being super educated or not, not really jumping into it. But I do think there's a, a case to be made for like, hey, low barrier to entry. But like you said, you know, maybe maybe more standards as you go or like some sort of bottom line. If you haven't done this, then you lose it. On the other hand, you could say it's, you know, it's no one's making or forcing people to to choose those agents. People choose their Aunt Betty for their own reasons. So I, I do think this is a, a really interesting conversation. I also think it's one of the reasons that we report on when you have top producers, whether they're loan officers or real estate agents jumping to other teams or jumping to, you know, or getting poached or, or deciding to leave, it's a big deal because according to those statistics, if you're, if you're, you know, looking at that, the tier five and tier six, you are changing the game for your company one way or the other, if they leave or if you, or if you can get them by, by making those personnel decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Well, James, thank you so much for being on with us today. I appreciate this. This It's a great article. Everyone should go read it. It's uh, part of our data digest that you do every week uh, that really looks at stats and and data and and finds interesting stories there, which is exactly what we did here. So James, thanks so much for being on. Cool. Thanks very much, Sarah. 